Welcome to Tisky. I am on. Welcome to Tisky <laughs> Sour, you idiots. It's been a dramatic and ideologically polarized week in Britain. Trump's visit has seemingly provided a boost to the UK far right. In a press conference, Trump claimed immigration was changing European culture for the worse. And in The Sun repeated the far right dog whistle claim that Sadiq Khan is to blame for terror attacks in London last year. Trump's visit also prompted massive resistance from people uh, against his far right brand of politics. Last Friday, 250,000 people joined the Stop Trump demonstration, making it the largest ever demonstration on a weekday in Britain. I think maybe just less people have jobs nowadays. And the largest demo on any day since the Iraq war. Perhaps more surprisingly, Trump's visit prompted the biggest surge in interest in communism since Trotsky met an ice pick. That's all because our very own Ash Sarkar, global superstar, went viral with the now legendary phrase, I'm a communist, you idiot. You can visit our website and buy your very own t-shirt with that very phrase. No, the phrase is I'm literally a communist. Literally, uh, you miss the, literally. The t-shirt's right. quite polite. I right. Um, obviously, you know now because they've both spoken. Uh, oh. But I could not have been joined by a more fortuitous pair of guests than the global superstar herself, Ash Saka. Woo! Ow! Most valued player in the international communist movement. I think I'm the only player in the international communist movement. It's like me and Aaron slowly drinking ourselves to death. <laughs> he hasn't no, been in Teen Vogue yet, though. Genuinely, I genuinely think... You, so, Ash is now the most influential self-described communist in Britain. I think that's a fact. She's in Teen Vogue. That's yeah. kind of the the line you've got across which means Karl Marx was once the most self-described uh, the most influential self-described communist in the country so you are quite literally the heir mm. to the to that particular title oh, after I... Karl Marx you're the heir to Karl Marx that's what I'm trying to say oh and may I ask you a question go on did I call EDF energy because I did not ask for a gas man and yet you are here oh, oh isn't that cute that's that sweet I like that yeah no, I've got all... you, can, you, can, you can borrow that yeah, I think... I'm taking it I'm taking it I'll pass that off <laughs> Oh, and you're actually like a remarkably good gas man, I reckon. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I don't know where we're going with this. It sounds a little bit like the sort <laughs> no, of no, chat no, we have. Really I'm on certain gay sex I'm chat. I'm <laughs> thinking about <laughs> that you've got to wait till the second half of the show to do the gay sex yeah, chat. Yeah, looking for that. For uh, I'm, I'm talking about you rallying those crowds. No, at hey. the Stop Trump demo. You're one of the co-organisers. Put Lots a lot of, of effort into it. There's no I in movement, Michael. We all did our bit. It was a collective team effort. Amazing. But there oh, is an I in movimento. Yeah, but we're not in Italy, yeah. so don't try and get me with Italian Brexit Ash. Um, Yeah, exactly. We've left that. We've voted to leave. Um, <laughs> no, so it was a massive, amazing team effort. Uh, there was just so many. And what we tried to do with it as well, that's why it's important that I'm not censored, because what we tried to do is uh, censor voices from... Uh, we're going to talk about this in a bit, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's just the intro, but you keep but going, But it was, it was a, a, a march. It was led by women, <laughs> particularly women of colour. And we had uh, at the front as well a migrants and refugee block. So the whole point was that this was a massive team effort, a massive collective effort. Uh, and it was particularly the kind of unpaid labour that or activism that went into that was 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 those who ate the sharp end. So that's very important to say. Very good. Okay. The very well put. Mm -hmm. The structure, I'm just saying it's the structure of the show is we're going to talk about that clip. We're going to talk about Ash on Piers Morgan. We're going to talk about communism versus socialism. Then we're going to talk about Trump, and we're going to end on Tommy Robinson and the UK far right. So to set us off, I know you've all seen it. I've watched it. A number of times 2.1 million people have watched it on twitter 1.5 million people have watched it on facebook and nearly a million people have watched it on youtube this is ash on good morning britain kill me so where will you be marching this in the next two days i'll be marching in westminster tomorrow alongside thousands of other people who found the policy of board separations mm -hmm. unconscionable yep. who think that the sight of our elected prime minister holding Donald Trump's hand is an utter embarrassment. Did you find Obama deporting wishing... three million people unconscionable? You yes. that many families. Yes, I did. Where and was, that's why and that's why I Where also... was your protest and march against that and, when he came to the country? And that's why I also protest... But if you feel so strongly and about that's why it, I also Ash, protest where was your protest march against Obama? In this country If you found that well, unconscionable too, where was the march? You do not have to go out and march it's double against standards. everything in order to make a point about one thing. No, if you find them both unconscionable no, and it's the same issue, you have to march twice, don't you? I would actually encourage you to maybe check out some of the other work that I've done where I've been intense. Tell you what I do, Ash. I go and check out some basic facts about your hero, Obama. He's not my hero. I'm how a communist, heroic he you idiot. <laughs> you didn't plan any protests against <laughs> him, did you? <laughs> Ash, Zero protests against Jesus. Obama. Jesus. You have every right to protest. Thanks, every right Susanna. to protest. 
Just to get it in perspective, there were none against Obama. There were none against Vladimir Putin. Why didn't you go out and march against Obama, Chair then, if you're so keen to investigate To make up for your own incompetence as a journalist. Sorry, sorry. You I... didn't hold Trump adequately to account when you interviewed yes, him. Yes, I did. You didn't think that climate I, change actually, was I held important Trump, enough to bring up... I held you Trump very to well to your account on a number team. of issues. It's embarrassing. Well, it may be and embarrassing. And instead, what you've done... Maybe instead, what you've you, done but actually, is straw man to your guest, what I try and words be, in my mouth, what I try and, be and with, you've deflected yes, from the actual you. argument at hand. What I try and do is be fair about Trump. What you do and to no one is else. be relentlessly anti-Trump and relentlessly pro somebody like Obama. I'm not I'm pro Obama. I've been a critic of Obama. I'm a critic of the Democratic Party because I'm literally a communist. <laughs> Ash, how did you keep your cool? Uh, <laughs> I I lost my cool. I actually thought I'd done really really badly um, when I came out. I uh, somewhat unprofessionally cried to the Aww. producer because I thought I'd fucked up the lines for the Stop Trump demo. I then... You rang me! Rang Owen and did some more, like, I um, think I've done really badly. And I was just, like, obviously really, really lovely and just, like... Well, I was like, that was amazing. Yeah. This like, is just really, what we needed. Really <laughs> kind. Um, it, it took me a while to register that, like, it might not have been what I'd planned to say, but it was valuable in a different kind of way um it meant that i mean i guess we kind of need to thank comrade morgan mm. because he has accidentally rehabilitated communism because he is so eminently dislikable what do you think goes through his mind do you think he knows what he looks like when he's shouting over a woman much younger than himself um i think that I, I was thinking about this because i was i was chatting to um a friend of mine who also does comms work and i was just like oh i i wish that i hadn't cried straight afterwards like you know it really bugged me i felt like a child who you know when you're being shouted at you think that what you've done wrong must be proportionate to how much you're being shouted at and then we kind of came to the conclusion that it's probably better to get upset about these things and it's better to at least have enough self-awareness that you're capable of thinking maybe i like fucked up here because if you don't do that you become piers morgan mm. like this is someone who is um either incapable or unwilling to factor in the feelings of other people when it comes to his own sense of his own uh career trajectory um and i think it's kind of sad to have made that kind of devil's bargain where you go all right i'm going to be really successful by forfeiting whatever critical capacity i once had because he must have had some to kind of rise mm. to the heights that he did you can't do that being like a complete numpty mm. but like i'm gonna the british establishment would we say there were that many bars at I that mean, level of i mean i think that ability. there's like sometimes a basic level of understanding the social fabric in which you exist which he has since jettisoned for money and the approval of racists fascists and demagogues and i think that's really really sad like i think sometimes you can detect like this little deflationary wheeze coming out of his body like as he sort of registers like oh yep yeah, there it is that's the last of my self-respect gone yeah, I mean, I always wonder with that, does he have that level of self-awareness? I mean, I'm both intrigued, but also not, because mm. the idea of getting into Pierce Morgan's mind fills me with abject horror. Mm. I have very little interest. I have things to do with my life which <laughs> don't involve um, that. But um, it is worth, it is a serious point we need to make, which is he hectored, harangued, made up your views. When you corrected him, he still kept making up your views. And the next day, this guy, this bloke, uh, who uh, has quite literally praised Benito Mussolini, who quite rightly uh, met a fate of being uh, hanged from a, a lamppost. Um, and he is somebody who has gone around Europe recently supporting fascist movements and far-right extreme movements. He is somebody, obviously, from Breitbart, a far-right, extreme-right uh, website. And he treated him like this respectable mm. adult who you know who wasn't going to interrupt him deferential mm. and you just think there is a like he spoke to a, a, a young Muslim uh, leftist uh, journalist who was his intellectual superior and that is an understatement um, and that is a compliment but not much of a compliment given where he's from but you are anyway by several factors you know and he, he didn't have any deference any respect whatsoever and then you had this proto-fascist um, 
who uh, went on LBC and basically incited violence. And, and, and it was deferential, it was respect. It was but I think he knows exactly what he's doing there. Like, that's the thing in terms of, like, self-awareness. I think that what he's made is a, a political and personally financial calculation, which is to say, all right, uh, we're in a moment of intense political change and look at what's going on in the States, look at what's going on elsewhere in Europe. The only game in town, uh, if you are a face which in some way represents establishment interest, is to tilt heavily towards culture wars. I get asked on to GMB all the time. I've only said yes twice. And in between, all the times where I said no were things like, do you think this comedian should be banned? Mm. Um, you know, are, what about campus, uh, you know, safe spaces cultures? What about this? What about that? It's all culture war stuff. And I was like, well, you know, why don't you get me on to talk about housing sometime? Why don't you get me on to talk about uh, the NHS sometime or people's pay? They don't want to know. Mm. They've made an editorial decision to really chase this. Um, it was all Which about... Which is just aping Fox News, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the contrast between his treatment of me and his treatment of Steve Bannon <clears throat> was not accidental. You know, I think if you watch that clip, I might not have gotten it, been able to say all the things that I wanted to say, but certainly I don't think that Piers Morgan looks like a particularly uh, reasonable or insightful fellow. Um, he was sharing it <laughs> again and again and sharing no. the extended version and sharing the articles about it because a conflict which pits a, you know, rabid and you know furious exchange mm. of words with as you said like a young woman of color also not the most observant muslim in the world but a muslim notionally um leftist and then that deferential treatment to bannon is what he's after because he's saying to the forces of racism of xenophobia of fascism profoundly anti-democratic forces mm. look i'm on your side mm. please don't hang me yeah, which is why he gets Trump interviews before anyone else. So it's sort of like mm -hmm. a careerist strategy to say I'll be completely deferential to oh, yeah. anyone who's close to the American establishment. It. Because isn't I mean a lot of time I just think he's a toddler who's pissed himself going oh, look <laughs> at me I piss myself everyone. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. just how much I mean he's genuinely flattered by the fact that he's like mm. the most powerful man on earth. You know he starts his article by this you know the warmth with which Donald Trump greets mm. him, which most people would find humiliating beyond description. Oh, yeah. uh, the most contemptible uh you know uh, you know the, this this center of you know this extreme right-wing demagogic um and sexual predator mm. uh, to, to get validation from such a man for most people would strike horror in in every fiber of their being but for him is a case of this means i'm a i'm a really you know he, you can see on his twitter video, he goes on about how many twitter followers he has mm. which i find odd because he's like engagement on his tweets is really low I'd, I'd like mm. I have no idea what you know like nobody people are either following him because it's like it's you like know, when watching... you want to watch like a monster truck crash in slow motion <laughs> yeah, exactly. like you don't necessarily want that monster truck's opinion on like institutional arrangements following <laughs> Brexit you just kind of want to watch the like catastrophe unfold alright we should move on from Piers soon but first of all Ash do you know why Owen on Friday got himself actually I think it was on Thursday got himself banned from Good Morning See, I'd have Britain. thought that you'd have been the ideal, um, you know, follow-up tap-dancing donkey in the culture wars, like, to get brought on. So why doesn't he want you? Well, so what happened there, right, is the uh, producer, one of the producers... Can we get the tweet up, Gary, while? The producer, um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got into this annoying cycle of um, Twitter spats with him, but he's so easy. I mean, because he just... He has no wits or, mm. you know, he can't he can't think on his feet. He, he, I mean, he just comes up with really kind of pathetic kind of, oh, you're like a little child as he, you know, women. I'm just bringing you up. I just want to get you to read out the tweet. Yeah, well, I'm doing I it now. It in your voice. Oh, I see. Right. Okay, I'll you do can, that now. Can, uh, it's there, look. Oh, oh, here we go. Um, right. So... I no when I I did a poll of uh yeah I did a poll of, Can of I just read the tweet? Oh, oh do right. I bother going a good morning Britain tomorrow to listen to Piers Morgan verbally masturbating all over himself <laughs> or am I wasting my life thoughts and then the producer said um we'd love to have you on so I I sent back um I said I'm just polling I'm mm. polling my Twitter followers <laughs> first and then he did a retweet saying you're banned but I've had this kind of like um uh kind of ongoing uh, uh spat with him 
Yeah, so he asked me again. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know why. Can we not talk about Piers Morgan? We're moving ever, on. This is the last thing that's ev- going to be said ever about again Morgan. in the history of my life. Oh, but it was so satisfying watching you rile him up like that. But he said to me, like, go, you know, good. he just kept going on because I did a tweet going, weird how you treated one guest, uh, mm. describe versus this uh, fascist. Anyway, but he ended up by going, go play with your baby balloon, uh, you silly little boy. You, oh, because you look childish. Uh, it's also just like, Correct. I look really young for my age. <laughs> yeah, I moisturise. Right. That's such an insult. I mean, some age better than others, Piers. Um, I think I, that white people with good politics age well. I've noticed this. This is great. This no, is good. they really do. Like, I think it's, it's up there with like moisturising and sun protection. If you've got progressive politics as yeah. a white person, you will age beautifully. Socialism's good for your health. It's good for your skin. It's good for your soul. It really is. Uh, that could be our little slogan. <laughs> uh, so I just said I have nothing to do with the Trump balloon, but at least it'll go down in history for something other than being a disgraced newspaper editor who sucked up to a grotesque Nazi praising sexual predator. Ooh! So, ouch. Just saying. Very good. Bars. Well, it's just, Owen, you know, bars. just trees have to be deployed. Mm-hmm. We're okay, going to talk about communism. I think we should talk about communism. Uh... So I was actually surprised by how little kickback you got from calling yourself a communist live on breakfast TV. Probably <laughs> most surprising was the positive reaction this got from both Elle magazine and Teen Vogue. <laughs> so let's bring up that Elle magazine article, which finishes with the phrase, Ash is literally a communist and literally our hero. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and the Teen Vogue article in which you managed to bring in the, Gundri- the Grundrisse. Mm. Uh, fragments of the machine. Uh, Ash. Yeah. Clearly some of the people reading Teen Vogue or L mm-hmm. would have been unsure what a communist is. Yeah. Or why you identify as one. Can you explain to us why you told Piers Morgan you were literally a communist? Literally a communist. I mean, the thing is, is that like when you say like, well, why did you tell Piers Morgan? The answer to that is really simple. I got pissed off and I lost my temper um, because... I thought it was plainly obvious that there's a whole set of people whose politics are whether or not you're a communist, like even if you're just like a fairly soft social democrat, whose politics are to the left of Obama's and would be intensely critical of uh, his expanded use of detention, of deportation, of drone bombings, uh, the kind of um, devil's bargains he made with Wall Street, you know, uh, following um, the financial crisis. You know, there's lots of people who, who... be angry about that so that was why i was so frustrated the next question is like well why am i a communist Mm -hmm. and for me there are two aspects to this answer and one is about a reading of history and then the other one is is fundamentally about the future for me the um bit which is about history isn't about um that intensely authoritarian violent repressive a block of communist regimes, either in terms of Soviet Russia or thinking about Mao, thinking about then some places in India as well, such as Kerala. And I think that those are really important histories to look at and to analyze, to look at the, um, you know, bloody swath that they cut through much of the global South and Eastern Europe and critique that. But when you look at the history of decolonization, and I think the reason why decolonization failed is because there was a... Uh, compromise being made where there could be a level of political enfranchisement for people of colour in the global south following decolonisation in order to protect white capital and the structures of ownership and here I'm not just talking about these structures of ownership being badly mediated or managed by the state but the uh, essence of ownership and production in the global south is largely the same as it was under colonialism still the same exploitation of labor still uh, the same exploitation of resources and still profits um, fleeing those countries apart from a very narrow social and e- economic strata at the top so yeah first and foremost I'm a communist because my reading of colonial history takes me in that direction you know Fanon was a Marxist his you know the beauty of his analysis is that it was drawn from psychoanalysis um, I think that Freud is kind of a uh, undervalued in readings of Fanon and Marx um you know he was taking theories of production and applying it on a global scale whereas Marx was largely contained uh, within the boundaries of the nation state and the second bit and for me this is the really exciting bit and this is why I think communism can do so much work in terms of expanding our political horizons is that it says well look as Marx set out in Fragment on the Machine 
uh, fixed capital, right, automated labor is a contradiction and a crisis in capital. So it's not a crisis that can be managed because it is a tendency of capital to automate labor because it's cheaper. Um, they don't need, robots don't need breaks. They don't need uh, girlfriends or holidays or um, casual dress Fridays, very, very easy to manage. Um, and in that sense, on the one hand, automation does what uh, we expect it to, is that it mm. makes uh, human labor a lot more precarious. Uh, you can't uh, collectively agitate for uh, better wages or conditions when fewer of you are in work. But also conversely, and this is what Mark says, is that it gives you a glimpse of what the good life could be, which is a world without work, a world without scarcity, um, and an idea of abundance that's generated largely without toil. And I think that that's the imaginative boundary that we need to be pushing. Now, you can distribute that abundance and leave structures of ownership largely intact. Sure, right? You can have universal basic income as a soft social democrat, or you could have, um, you know, more onerous levels of taxation and be a socialist. You don't actually have to be a communist. What communism does, and for me the really exciting thing, is that it says, well, why don't we go that step further and just say like, let's just distribute things equally. Why don't we bring everything into com common ownership and have um, the fruits of all forms of uh, production, labor, whether those fruits are uh, ones of ideas, ones of democratic participation, cultural ones, um, be decided by those people who are producing those goods? Um, why don't we have people uh, be empowered to make decisions that affect uh, every single aspect of their life, whether it's political, social, economic, cultural? I think that's what communism does, and that's why I think it's pretty fun. I'm going to go to team socialism in a second. First of all, keep your comments coming in. Uh, all your opinions about communism are pretty interesting. Uh, there were two comments I liked about the age issue. Aaron mm -hmm. Bastani says Marxism keeps you young. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who Marxism it was. Marxism of you, like. But someone mm. was pointing out that Seamus Milne was actually around in the 1926 general strike. <laughs> and it is just his commitment to the words of Marx that is. He was at the Paris Commune. So fresh. I, I met him. Uh, I've met him the once. The man doesn't and age. He's the same age. He's actually a little bit. Uh, I think he's the same age as my stepdad. My stepdad, lovely, lovely man. Uh, but just doesn't look as young as Seamus he Milne. Looks like, he looks like Gammon, all right? He, he does. <laughs> yeah, and, no. and he would admit it. Seamus Milne looks like he's been injecting stem cells into his neck every day. Also, Corbyn and Sanders are probably healthier than me. I mean, honestly, <laughs> socialism is exceptionally good for your health. That's what we've learned. Cor that is with Corbyn, that's veganism and porridge every morning. All right, team socialism. Uh, well, no. I mean, no, for me, this debate is about can, you, can we reclaim a vision of a stateless classless society uh, of material abundance, of, of cooperation, of liberation from wage slavery, um, of alienation from labour, uh, which is, you know, at the heart of, 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 of the modern capitalist system. Um, and uh, where, you know, when Karl Marx spoke about, I mean, I mean, what was it, fishermen in the morning, artists in the evening, mm. you know, that kind of the division of labour where you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're driven into a certain, uh, you know, where you're, you have a certain, you know, your category of wage labour, which you are uh, trapped in. Um, and where, you know, to each according uh, to their need, from each according to their ability. Oh, hello. Um, yeah, and that is a society which we should all aspire to. I don't think it will happen probably within my lifetime, but, you know, that that itself is is a society we should aspire to. And and the issue is, can you rec can we reclaim that from, from the Stalinist Gulag? Because what happened is... Obviously, the Russian Revolution of 1917, the second one, was in a semi-feudal society with uh, a history of, of czarist despotism, um, which then got invaded by 21 foreign armies, um, and which, you know, there was a very, very small industrial proletariat, industrial working class, uh, the vanguard of which got wiped out in the Civil War, which was an exceptionally brutal civil war. Um, and... And, and then you got this, you know, degeneration because the the hope of the Russian revolutionaries was that there'd be revolution in Germany, the most advanced mm. industrialized nation, certainly before first world the First World War, um, and 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 that obviously was, you know, 
in 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 kind of Mar- in, in Marx and Engels and so on, their view was the advanced industrialized countries would be ripe for revolution, and the Mensheviks, the uh, other half of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. Um, that the other faction, they they ended up with this kind of dogmatic uh, interpretation of Marx, which then lent itself to kind of reformism, which was, well, actually, we need to go through capitalism first and develop the productive means, and then we've got a massive industrial proletariat, and then we can, you know, move on to socialism. So now we've basically got to let capitalism do its thing. Um, but it, it, it was starved at birth because it... And, and, and then what happened? Because Stalinism assumed leadership of the international official communist movement and strangled all dissent and because it had the prestige of course of being you know the, the official kind of communist state and then it got it won further prestige during you know the defeat of nazism which the soviet union played the preeminent role 80 percent of all um, combat deaths were on the eastern front uh, we would be conquered by the nazis without the extraordinary sacrifice of the soviet people during uh, World War Two. There's no point pretending otherwise. 27 million uh, Soviet uh, people died during World War Two, um, and you know, and, and and but because of that, then the anti-colonial movement, obviously trying to emancipate itself from the horrors of colonialism, uh, and, and they were struggling against the Western colonial states. Clearly, obviously, looked to and got material and political support from the Soviet bloc. So you've got this kind of Soviet, you know, and then and obviously with Maoism, despite the schism between China and the Soviet Union, you got this, you know, kind of various forms of Stalinism got so much hegemonic control um, that that original v- vision of communism um, was just completely toxified and. And, and, and sidelined. What I think is interesting about this country, though, is... Shit, boy, team communism... No, team socialism sounds a lot like a communist. No, but, but I mean... I think, I think actually me and Owen are, are broadly in agreement of being, like, es- essentially big old starry eye utopians at heart. And that that's what guides us through the slog of engaging with an often soul-destroying parliamentary democracy. But on that, though, it's weird with the, the issue of communism, I think. What I find is amazing, because I actually don't think, like, we're laughing about the intervention, but it was actually quite a useful intervention. Uh, but, like, actually a very important in- intervention. Because actually, despite all the baggage which communism particularly obviously has because of the gulag and the exter- mm. you know the murder of, uh, of so many people, um, in- including the original Bolsheviks, mm-hmm. you know, almost the entire Bolshevik leadership, was exterminated by Stalin mm. um, or exiled, but mostly murdered. Um, you know, and and because the original communist dream was it's such loggerheads with what Stalinism represented. But it, what's different about Britain compared to other Western countries is we didn't have a mass communist movement. Italy and France obviously had mass communist parties. In France, the communist party used to be the biggest party. They've been in government. Um, Japan even has a ma- you know had a has a communist party which was significant. Whilst in Britain it was more in the industrial front. So in the twenties you had the shop stewards movement, um, where where the communist party played a big role. You had, for example, in in the thirties the hunger marches in in Britain during the Great Depression, um, where the communists played a preeminent role. And then from after World War Two they had that big role. But what's weird about communism in Britain is a bit more complicated than that because New Labour partly emerged from it in a weird way or Marxism today because Marxism today so you had John Reed and Peter Mandelson were both in the Young Communist League but Marxism today which was the kind of in-house theoretical journal of the uh, Communist Party of Great Britain um, and the theoretical um, you know they had lots of people like Stuart Hall who obviously you know we looked to and and, and had made brilliant contributions but they they uh, the, the, a lot of the key New Labour people came out of Marxism. I'm going to make an anti-communist provocation. Okay. Okay, you're playing a risky one. Yeah, I, I feel like both of your histories of communism made it seem like the overbearing state, sort of a one-party state, bureaucratic rule, gulags were totally accidental. So they happened because of a particular series of events, because Stalin's team got more powerful than the other crew, because there was a civil... I mean, obviously, the civil war and the invasion was was pretty Mm. fucking important. But you can look at a variety of communist states around the world. All actually existing communisms became one-party states. And once you replace sort of markets, production is going to have to be organised by some other mechanism, which tended to be targets um, and was controlled by bureaucrats, which made it pretty vulnerable to widespread corruption um 
And I mean, do you think the record of actually existing communism is something we want to be tying ourselves to? Not just no, not just ideologically, not just sort of like as a PR move, but also as something that we want to recreate. Do, have actually existing communisms not shown communism to be a slightly flawed political ideology? Well, I think the word flawed is the right one to use. And that's something which, you know, Aaron Dutty Roy, who I think is deeply Marxist, and much of a point of view, um, would say communism has been because it has uh, replicated capitalism's tendency towards the concentration of power and resources within an elite few. I don't, I don't think that's controversial to say at all. The reason why I think that communism is so important politically, uh, discursively, imaginatively, is because I think what it is able to do um when you couple it with a politics of liberation and i'm not just talking about liberation politics in terms of like identity politics i'm talking about libertarian po politics in terms of thinking about um the liberation of human potential uh from the oppressive forces of state management is a really important way for us to, you know, when we're committing ourselves to socialist projects, whether it's uh, this iteration of the Labour Party or whether it's, you know, the um, uh, more socialist as opposed to communist strands of, say, you know, the Black Panther Party's political programmes, is that it gives us, I think, an entry point into critique because we've got the idea of a kind of um, utopianism behind it. Well, what so, about if the other so, thing is worse? So, so, for instance, so for instance, it would be when you're thinking about, well, what should our housing policy look like, right? So in terms of what would a socialist housing policy look like? And this is something we're talking about in this country, is that, you know, we want to vitally replenish housing stock by building loads of it. Is it going to be big old bureaucratic socialism where you don't have much for say in where you live, how you live, uh, you know, where or when you get moved, et cetera, et cetera? Or do you start trying to run things like, I don't know, housing communes or co-ops in which you can also experiment with different ways of living? I just want a flat, to be honest. I say abolish rent, nationalise all land. Mm -hmm. Like Singapore. And, well, I think in terms of land, I think that you can run in a communist fashion in the sense, or in, in actually existing communist fashion, which is that you give the state all the fucking land and they can rent it to us at very low, or just give it to us. I mean, they could rent it to us and that could be a form of taxation. We get, we, but yeah. I do think in terms of material production in the, the productive economy, uh, markets ain't so bad. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I find it interesting because Singapore is often looked to by kind of libertarian right wingers but land is almost all nationalized and almost all housing is public um in singapore so it's it's, it's, it's an odd you know you get these odd kind of different in norway you've got massive public ownership of much of the economy actually in singapore as well you do with kind of arms length public ownership no i mean look the official communist regimes of the 20th century were obviously a horror show um i, I guess why i get frustrated with this though is so got to probably tread carefully here like, take Maoism. I mean, Maoism, again, the, the horrors of Maoism are undeniable. What I'd say is the mortality rate of India and China were comparable before the Chinese Revolution, mm -hmm. and there was a massive divergence after mm -hmm. the Chinese Revolution and mortality rates declined. You then got the, you know... in You look at the uh, main famines in India and the numbers that were killed under, um, you know, ostensibly liberal democracy. Hu like, you know, I think well, it's well, even... The major uh, famines under... I mean, I mean, that, I mean again, that's a really... That, so this, that's one of the points I wanted to exactly emphasise, which is... I mean, the Great Leap Forward, you basically got reversions of pre-revolutionary mortality rates. That's not to justify what Mao did. It was heinous and criminal mm. and murderous. And, and yet, at the same time, those who go through the body bags of, uh, as they say, communism, take British colonialism, tens of millions of people died through unnecessary famines in India under British rule, which were just or like... Close to time. Well, indeed, but tens of millions died. Uh, there's a brilliant book called Late Victorian Holocausts mm. by Mike Davis, which looks at... Uh, just you know the the multiple uh, famines which the British state was directly responsible for, as much as Stalin was in the Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine, as much as Mao was in the in, in the Great Leap Forward, um, and and the horrors of colonialism from you know King Leopold in Bel in, in 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 Congo, where ten million mm. people is estimated died. You know, read King Leopold's Ghost. It's really brilliant book on that um you know across where you got the german colonial states where they were just you know exterminations which kind of foreshadowed the holocaust um but you don't you know those were all linked to capitalism and and therefore you don't you, you, there's not the same kind of uh, interpretation but at the same time i mean we've got to divorce ourselves from the, mm -hmm. the stalinist bureaucratic mm -hmm. regimes uh, the lifeblood of socialism is democracy um and 
I think what we need to look at is workers' self-management, workers' democratic control. I think new forms of technology can allow us to talk about more about how you can have democratically run public services, industries. So we're not talking about the old, you know, the Stalinist experiments of the 19th, of the 19th, of 20th century were calamitous disasters. Um, that's not to say that elements, you know, you know, I mean, if you look, for example, take Cuba, that's an official mm -hmm. communist regime. It was run by a mafia state. What country would you most like to have lived in in the 20th century? Um, well, I mean, you obviously you discount the weather because I mean you well, can't. Well, obviously, that's, that's, got no, that's got nothing to do with political systems. But it's where everyone in the 20th century started from because obviously so, the so, so, so what but the I'd Western states the all West, got huge wealth which they accumulated yeah. through mm. colonialism. And then in the non-Western states, probably the country that you'd most want to live in, sort of like at the end of the 20th century, is something like South Korea, mixed economy, export-led. In the north, you probably want to live state-led oh. development with a bunch of markets. It definitely wasn't communism. No, it was a mixed economy. No. What you'd want to live in in the global north would probably be Sweden. Where would you want to live in the Caribbean? In the you know, where would you? I mean, Jamaica, Haiti, or Cuba? No, oh, potentially Cuba. Oh. Of course, Cuba. But also, I mean, you... even though it's a flaw, look, Cuba again. I believe in a democratic socialist society. Mm -hmm. Socialism is not socialism unless you have democracy, mm -hmm. where people have democratic control in their workplaces and in the broader. So I look at these states. I, I, I reject them. I reject Stalinism. I, re you know, but I do believe in genuine socialism, and genuine socialism means a society where you extend democracy to every sphere of life, the economy, the workplace and politics, where you bring into democratic public ownership as much of the economy as you can. Um, and um, and I just think that's the thing, you know, I, I don't believe, I'm not a social democrat, I don't believe in uh, where you just, you know, I don't believe in just restoring the post-war consensus, which was eradicated, mm. uh, which has led us to the mess we're in now and it is unsustainable. You have to build a different society which you embed where the institute, you know, where you have democratic management, which you can't just abolish in favour of, you know, because the, this post-war social democratic consensus, people didn't feel, have a sense of ownership. The, the nationalised industries felt completely remote, divorced from people. They had no say how, however they were run. When Thatcher privatised them, she said, in what sense do you feel like, this is public ownership, how? How do you feel as a member of the public? You have control over energy or water, but you could you could have shares. Now, obviously that share holding, mm. it's a joke. Nobody, you know, these were all snapped that's up. That's social by, democracy though. That's, you have liberal democracy, parliamentary oh. democracy, and you have a mixed economy, maybe with slightly more cooperative ownership than what was the post-1945 model. Well, no, because, like, the, because there's in the problems of social democracy, and I think that, um, I mean, obviously, uh, Cramsey has written about the problems of transformism, where you have a seeming, seeming lack of um, dissent or difference between like the two leading parties, and I think also Stuart Hall, um, in his forensic analyses of authoritarian populism, looked at how that lexicon of freedom and choice was uh, in in incredibly powerful, like incredibly appealing, and and reflected people's real lived material conditions. I think that how we're addressing this question, which is essentially treating Marx as little more than a technological determinist or treating communism as little more than um, a, you know, retrospective historical exercise by which we compare nations and that's kind of it and that's what it means to be a communist in 2018, um, I think is misleading of, uh, uh, in terms of how people identify themselves as communists, although lots of people I think are like, uh, retrospective in their viewpoint and also like misses the potential of it which is what does it mean to revive communism as a living political tradition and how does that function within a diverse and pluralistic leftist ecology for me that's the most interesting thing to talk about it's not communism at the expense of other ways of imagining the future but it's claiming the terrain of the future for leftism and for me it's saying well like let's take that outermost edge um where in which we say like hang on it is possible to abolish private property. It is possible to um, do away with the corrosive effect of money and this idea that something as arbitrary as the possession of money should be what excludes you from the means of survival or a happy life. Exactly. Um, For and, me, this is all a bit and, too ethical. I want to know about how power actually concentrates in different societies. Obviously, the way it concentrates in social democracies mm -hmm. is very problematic. So democracy, parliamentary democracy is often skewed towards people who end up owning capital and concentrating it. And maybe we could sort of redistribute that via mm -hmm. taxation or maybe the fact of having these powerful 
industrialist makes fair taxation impossible. I don't know, but do you know what I mean? It's, I want to look at not just what's the society we'd love to live in, mm -hmm. but what's a way of organizing society that's going to be in reality, considering the fact that people aren't perfect, considering the fact that power corrupts. But that's, but that's a conversation we're all having, right? And so that's the thing, and that's what I was saying about um, communism as something which helps us make decisions about how we organize socialist society in terms of do we tend towards bureaucratic bear moths because we think that that's the way to bring things under direct you know, under democratic oversight or do we think about um, democratizing those structures internally and thinking about collective forms of decision making direct democracy that's what I think uh, the promise of a libertarian communism can do in terms of having those conversations in a way which I don't think is in inherently antagonistic or at odds with what you guys yeah. are saying I mean this is anti-Stalinist communism obviously that very that, easy to say that but but, it, <laughs> but you know look I think the test is all three of us would be locked up under a Stalinist regime and probably probably lead uh, oh I'd uh, betray you first and then I'd get locked I'd betray up you so hard <laughs> Uh, so I, I don't think to be honest, any... maybe I'd work with the regime I was given. Who knows? Uh, but it's plausible, but we wouldn't. I don't think any of us could. You know, Reformism one hundred and one. We're, we're not. We're not here to. You know, they are just. As I've said, you know, Stalinism won leadership of the international communist movement. They basically took the franchise. That's basically mm. what happened. Stalinist totalitarianism. Uh, after the horrors of the civil war in Russia in a semi-feudal state which had only ever known despotism, uh, czarist despotism, uh, you know, and that became seen as the blueprint of what was seen as, as, as communism. I just think, you know, the debate is completely different, which is, is you know, it, it, I mean, socialism, as, as I would say, so take democratic public ownership. Herbert Morrison, who's Peter Mandelson's granddad. Um, he, really? I didn't know that. He is. Yeah. He'd... He designed. He so in the post-war government, he was uh, of of Clement Attlee was was the kind of one of the figureheads of the Labour right, and he was in charge of drawing up what nationalisation would look like, and he basically modelled it on private corporations. So they became public corporations, um, where you didn't, you know, the workers had no real sense of participation. Neither did. Uh, service users. So during the miners' dispute, you had the National Coal Board. It was a nationalised uh, industry which was at war with the miners, <laughs> and they imported this, you know, horrendous right-wing American. T uh, sorry, not because he's American; he's right. I'm just saying he was from the United States. Uh, this horrendous reactionary who uh, a horrendous uh, reactionary who happens to be from th America. That's what but I we meant. Don't essentialise those qualities. No, that's what I meant. Not uh, all Americans. But but what I'm what I'm what I'm really interested in is democratic public ownership and how you know you can use social you know you can use uh, you, you know new forms of technology uh to to give people a democratic say over the services they use so it's an alternative to statism i don't believe i'm not a statist i don't believe in top down nationalized industries which are run by bureaucrats i believe in like democratically controlled services by workers and service users and you could have a management board. This is the, you know, this is with the rail industry where you have a third of those in charge of it are uh, uh, the state, a third are workers and a third are passengers. I'm throwing passengers. out a question. Parliamentary democracy, yay or nay? Not just should we engage in elections in the here and now, I think we all agree with that. Mm -hmm. But do we see it as fundamentally bourgeois democracy and we want to find a more real one? Or do we think that it's got some proper value that we should appreciate and defend and parliamentary democracy in terms of the one that we have now is a complete fuck i mean it could right? be pr i mean you, you're what i mean is representative democracy as it exists in in the I liberal mean, democracies of the world so like for me the really instructive thing to read is uh politics as vocation the um weber essay which um i apologize profusely to my uh final year politics students but i set for them as a text and made them all read and one of the things that's most interesting about uh politics as a vocation is how mind-numbingly and almost aggressively tedious it is and that's that's faber's whole point really is that politics i should... thought you just meant his writing which is also no, that true too. that too no his writing is boring um and his politics is also um, you know, a panegyric to tedium. It's a celebration of, of tedium. Because what he says is that politics, and, you know, thinking about, um, you know, what he what he had just uh, been living through was the kind of um, failures of resolution, uh, of revolutions. Um, I think that uh, Rosa Luxemburg had been murdered either shortly before he gave this lecture or shortly after, but it's all kind of roughly contemporaneous in Germany. Um, and he says that what politics is, is the... Uh, long slow drilling through hard boards 
And that idea of a professional class being entrusted with politics because it must be conducted at a pace which is slow and ponderous and, um, you know, process-led um, and is basically set up in uh, direct opposition to uh, organic embodiments of political will and direct democracy and social movements and endeavours of human collect- uh, collectivity has dictated what we think of as a parliamentary democracy ever since. Oh, in parliamentary democracy, yay or nay? Yeah, it's just insufficient, is what I would say. Represent it, I believe, in the right of, uh, you know, the, the citizens of a state to elect representatives on their behalf. Um, but it's it's just not enough. And that's why I believe in extending... Demo- you know, socialism should be seen as extension of democracy to every sphere of life mm-hmm. as much as possible. Direct democracy is always tricky because people have kids and lives and work. And Hashtag too many meetings. I mean, yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily, not everyone in the world wants to sit in long, you know, on a Thursday rainy night. Weird, I know, as that sounds. So I just think, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I just believe in, you know, I believe in maximising participation as much as possible. Um but I, I believe just in economic and industrial democracy. And there was no huge debates about that in the 1970s, industrial democracy. That was a big thing at the time. And I just think new forms of technology now, how you can engage online, you know, that that's something which makes that more realisable than getting people to sit in a hall on a Thursday evening. Yeah, no, that's fucking shit, right? And that's yeah. also, I mean, that's also another form of like long, slow drilling through hardboards, I, I think. I'm, I'd say, I'd say my, my suspicion of communism and mm. actually Is that existing it communism. Too fun? Is that it, one, it sounds too fun and I'm a really boring guy. <laughs> um, two, I'm an aspirational guy. And even though I don't have air conditioning, I'd like to be able to afford it one day. So I think maybe I should start a business, get a really big income, and then I can get air con in my, in my studio. Gonna get, no, everyone's going to get air that's con. Not, that's not actually my right. suspicion. My suspicion is uh, that it's quite easy to say representative democracy is a limited form of democracy. Let's have another one. No, um, just extend it. Which is, it. Just which extend is what, it. what, yeah, you know, I, I think as addition, that's fine. Mm. But so what you had in the Soviet Union mean, is they had workers' democracy instead of parliamentary democracy. And in Venezuela, you have did. sort of like democracy of... No, but that's what they called it, right? Oh, they called so it the that, whole but it was a hard point. It was the just whole not point is you democracy. say parliamentary democracy is bourgeois. We I have a form I of more... We have a more... No, I'm not saying you did. I'm saying this is sort of like a communist sign. We have a more fundamental form of democracy. And I think that one of the benefits that history has shown, really, is that parliamentary democracy is a little bit more transparent than most of the other forms. And so if you try and replace it with something more fundamental workers' democracy, direct democracy, you kind of end up with a regime that's harder to overthrow. No, you just have representative democracy, which governs the the, the state polity, whatever you want to call it. And then you have workers' democracy as well. I mean, you don't... It's not to replace one or the other. You know, you should have representative democracy, uh, but you should also try and extend democracy. You know, how do you have democratic control over you know at the moment much the, the problem with the the, the, the the kind of critique of bourgeois democracy is basically uh, whoever is in office the same people are in power mm-hmm. that you have vested economic interests who are always there the the multinational corporations but under communism business. they're literally the same people that's not true though because you it, it, but if you're no, talking about democratising like the you're economy ta- you're talking you're talking about a specific form of communism which both all the ones that have existed which both which both but we don't we've gone through why that's all right. Let's, I think we should both, move on to Trump to be honest I, I think we should move on to Trump extensively right uh, we can all agree bloody social democrat my god joining the Labour Party changed you didn't what? it yes <laughs> anyway I'm a socialist there's nothing so. wrong with a journey <laughs> uh, Although, if th- that whole line of you get more conservative as you get older, I'm only fucking 28. <laughs> so, who knows what could happen? Like, the thing is that you kept <laughs> candidate for Thorak. You were back, like, people are only in their 20s to make people in their 30s feel insecure about themselves, so... No, actually, the, the whole conservative... Uh, you get older as you get more conservative as you get older. That that ladder doesn't work anymore. I'm never it gonna doesn't. Own, I'm never going to yeah. own a home. Um, so I'm never going to have that vested I, interest. I definitely became So I'm still going to be in favour of nationalising all the land. I became less rigid as I got older. I think like, what, three years ago, uh, I'd have considered having a discussion that was like this, where we're like, oh yeah, we broadly agree on these things, we broadly disagree on these things, as like, um, behold, the impure. Like, it, I yeah. would have, you know, really considered it as like a, a betrayal of principle, I think, whereas now I don't, I don't think that, because um, there are stakes now. 
You there are lots of stakes. But also, the young getting more right wing is bollocks because in 1983, Thatcher had a nine point lead amongst the 18 to 24 year olds. And now Labour, what, in one poll, had a like 52 point lead. Mm. In, in the 1980s, it, at least in one presidential election, young people more likely to support Reagan than older mm. people. So it just shows us that is a, that's a myth. Young people are cooler now. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Stop Trump demo. Uh, there were 250,000 people on the demo. I talked about that in the introduction. Well done to both of you. I know you were both involved Team in the organisation of I did not organise it. What I do is I let other people go to the meetings and then I get the mic. Um, it was really, as Owen said, a team effort. Lots of unsung heroes. Lots of people that don't have a public profile and just like are really fucking good at like logistics and like doing all that really unsexy work which makes sure that everyone knows what they're doing and where they're going and that like the PA system works and that everyone's <laughs> got enough water. Um, like all that stuff which means that you can have that kind of spectacular turnout. Um, and doesn't get you retweets. Uh, yeah. Basic question. First of all, I'm going to say, whether or not you want communism or socialism, the way to achieve it is by funding a new left media, which means you should please, please go to support.navaramedia.com and subscribe. Give us a monthly donation, which will make this possible. We need to keep renting this studio because land is not yet nationalized hopefully one day it will be and they'll give it out to new left media projects and we'll remember who donated to us and subscribed to us and then when we are at the helm of a corrupt bureaucratic undemocratic monolith we will reward you yeah if it like gets... salt base sprinkling land and resources upon your head Babe, you're, you're assuming you're going to be in the politburo i'm getting wiped out in the first no because the problem is <laughs> I've, I've already mapped this like um, with my friend who we were like okay Right, if it was the worst kind of communism, where would you be? And he was like, well, you were too prominent too quickly. And I think you argued too ardently, which meant in the first wave of purges, when they're getting rid of threats to the power rather than like, you know, ideological deviance, you're gone, mate. And I was like, yeah. Mm. And what's worse is that I would have shopped all my mates first and then I'm gone. Mm. And then I was like, what about you, bruv? And he was just like, right, plan is that they always need people to like count the staples and the grain and that's what I'm going to do till I rise to a position of prominence where no one can get rid of me. Simple question, what was the point in the Trump demo? I'm going to start with... That was a much better question. OJ. Than what? what was the point of it? Yeah, why? Why bother? Uh, oh, blimey, where'd you begin with that one? Um, firstly... I've been thinking about that question all day. Um, so, uh, there are many reasons for that. Um, I mean, what was important for me was just about Trumpism as much as Trump. Obviously, we don't want to normalise bigotry, racism, misogyny, uh, anti-Muslim hatred. But for me, you know, all across the Western world, what we've seen since the financial crash is a deliberate, systematic attempt to scapegoat migrants, Muslims, refugees for all the crimes caused by the powerful. Um, and because the left had ceased to exist for a long time, they had a vacuum to fill. Um, and Donald Trump's just the most striking example of that. Um, and he's the kingpin of it. The you know there is a far right international which is developing speed. We have Trump's ambassador um, lobbying on behalf of Tommy Robinson. Um, the uh, all the racists and fascists in Europe feel legitimised and emboldened by the fact they feel they have uh, somebody sympathetic to their aims as the most powerful man on earth. So we had to you know we had to do that for a start. Uh, that we can't allow uh, Britain. And, uh, uh, well, Britain to become the puppet state of Trump's America, as many members of the Conservative Party and government uh, aspired to. Uh, obviously, we became the puppet of George W. Bush, and that ended in hundreds of thousands of dead Iraqis, millions displaced, uh, as well as blood and chaos in the Middle East. Um, climate change, the world's biggest polluter uh, in history, uh, walking away from the Paris Agreement. Uh, that poses an existential threat, climate change, to all of us, and what America does has the biggest impact of all. Um, the threat of war with Iran, um, walking out of the nuclear deal. John Bolton, one of Trump's key advisers, um, is has openly called for the bombing of, of, of Iran. I mean, there were just a, a trade deal with the US, which again, many uh, of the... Oh, hello. Thank many you of uh, uh, the... Thank you, Gary. Yeah, cheers, Gary. <laughs> uh, lots of the US... Oh, sorry, the British government. They, they want to um, have a trade deal, which would mean... The privatisation of the NHS, well, further, the opening of the NHS and public services to US multinationals and lowering of standards of workers' rights, of environmental standards. I mean, there are so many reasons. Yeah. For us, you know, the key thing I want, we wanted to do 
is to join the dots with what's happening here because Trumpism, if you like, is is you know we've had you know if you've got Baroness Vazi, one of the key you know elite well the, the most prominent Muslim female Tory politician who talks about the Conservative Party as an a systemically uh, Islamophobic party. Um, where you have you've had the deliberate relentless scapegoating of migrants and refugees Michael Gove trying to wash his hands today of the uh, vote leave campaign which he was a instrumental member when he did scaremongering about Turkey and and free and, and, and how many people would come into the country he's like oh it was a mistake exactly so, so we what, didn't mean to demonize the migrants it's we, had some consequences mm, Fuck. But we have to put pre- we have to put pressure you know Donald Trump is the, the danger is and and you get this with some liberal and centrist opposition focuses on his vulgarity and his bad manners and how uncouth he is and and almost uses them as kind of like god look how bad he is and look how virtuous we are in comparison for 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 Stop Trump, which I'm a very proud member of, um, we wanted to join the dots that this is, yes, the most striking and disturbing manifestation. And yes, it's legitimising and emboldening what's happening in this country and elsewhere in terms of those movements. Um, But we have to, you know, we have to go, well, look, actually, that is terrible what's happened in the United States, screaming kids being dragged from their parents and thrown in cages. But let's look at the gay refugees being deported to countries where, like Nigeria, where homosexuality is illegal. Let's look at Yarlswood Detention Centre. Let's let's look at the experience of Muslims in this country who face deliberate, relentless attacks by the media and the political elite um, and discrimination, systemic racism. So that, for me, is it. You know, Trump is, yes, the most striking example but it should be seen as an attempt to wage war against all of these injustices in this country and elsewhere. I think let's, I want to move on to the connections between Trumpism and the British right, which became, which were made very apparent actually on the occasion of this trip, partly because Steve Bannon came alongside Donald Trump. I suppose they weren't together, but they were here at the same time and that wasn't accidental. Uh, He was given quite a decent platform on Good Morning Britain, as we've discussed already, the day after Piers Morgan was interrupting you quite a lot, Ash, you didn't interrupt Steve Bannon. I had a, I had a quick mind blank about what his name was, but I got it in the end. It's like, I find that that happens when I think about his face too much. Yeah. Like I lose his name because I just think of like this jaw, which seems to be like detaching itself from like its hinges and like. Mm. Fascism is not good for your health. It's really bad for your health. So, also, so he's being a raging alcoholic, but you know. Yeah. Um, the most dramatic uh, sort of interventions by Bannon and Trump during this visit were in favour of Tommy Robinson, mm. uh, far right British fascist, basically, who's currently in prison for contempt uh, of court. Contempt of court. It's not a particularly controversial case. He was outside a case of a child sex offender. He started reporting on it. That was threatening to undermine the case. And he'd been, uh, he was on a suspended sentence for something else. So I think, I think when it comes to the Tommy Robinson case. And he pled uh, guilty. And he pled, he pled guilty. Um, I think that one of the conclusions that we can come to is if you had really strong feelings about the outcome of this case, which mm. was about the systematic sexual exploitation of girls and you really wanted to see justice be done and you were convinced that the only way to do that was to secure a conviction in that case you would put the interests of that case ahead of your own ego and your career and you would shut the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. And also previously a convicted mortgage fraudster. Um, Come on, that's the least of his crimes. Come no, on, just mortgage saying, fraud stuff. No, no, I'm just saying, no, no, no. What's interesting about him is he, you know, no, no, no. It reminds saying, you of Nick Clegg, you know, when he said, I wasn't going to go on the demo, but even though he was going to, even though no, he separated no. all the children, even though he did a Muslim ban, no, it was when I'm, he dissed the WTO. What when I thought, I have to turn up to this demo now. This what, guy is out of control. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he's held up by the far right as this uh, political prisoner who's been repeatedly incarcerated. Mm. I'm saying that what he's actually being incarcerated for are contempt of court, mortgage fraud, yeah. uh, a false passport, and and assault. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying it's like mm. the, the way he's portrayed as this kind of martyr. It's just like, no, he's just a fraudster who d- tries to derail court cases. Mm. All right, let's get up. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, Trump and Bannon have both been repping this guy hard so trump's ambassador for religious freedom i didn't even know that existed uh, but it is part of his administration has been lobbying for tommy robinson to be released Uh, there was a threat to the british government that there would be an official 
um, condemnation of their treatment of Tommy Robinson if this didn't happen. Steve Bannon then went on LBC to say that Tommy Robinson was the backbone of British society and that he was a good guy who should be released. He was also, I was going to show the video, but we couldn't download it from LBC. Bannon was also given a massive platform to say that there should be basically a civil war in Britain and that people mm. should rise up against elected politicians. So I'll quote it because we don't have the video. If I was in Middle England and said this wasn't what I voted for, I would rise up and make sure the guys in Parliament knew it. Um, he's asked to clarify, are you talking about civil war? And he says, yes, I'm talking about, well, he doesn't say civil war, but no, he says, war, yes, I'm talking about war. war. I'm talking about war. Can you imagine Very... if a Muslim said that? Can you imagine if one of the most uh, prominent Muslim strategists in the world who uh, was enjoyed great proximity to uh, President of the United States had said that. Like, can we just let that image percolate? For They'd be imprisoned a now, probably. Yeah. He would be imprisoned. And I the mean, radio like, station would have probably got taken off air. You can't be... You can't be a uh, Muslim school student and use the word uh, leco terrorism in your French class. You can't be a Muslim primary school student and draw a picture of your dad slicing some cucumbers or, you know, a picture of, you know, your mum cooking with a rice cooker at home. Because let's face it, like primary school children are often shit at drawing and things don't look the way that they're meant to. Um, without that being cause for suspicion. You can't study security studies as a Muslim PhD student and want to read about terrorism without that being cause for suspicion. But you can be an open fascist, be someone who says, if they call you a racist, you know, wear that as a badge of honor and advocate war while visiting a different country. And just people go, well, that makes a excellent broadcast entertainment. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I mean, that was the other reason the process was so important because otherwise the danger was it would be a four-day um, political advert for Trumpism mm -hmm. uh, that he used the whole thing as a PR exercise uh, where you'd end up with the likes of Steve Bannon and others saturating the airways where you got personal friends of Donald Trump like Pierce Morgan and Nigel Farage uh, platforming them and, and, and normalising this, this horrendous form of... Well, this horrifying uh, threat of, um, uh, you know, this horrifying political ideology. Um, so, you know, for us, it was that, that again, was very important with that protest. But the, this is a really important point, which I think we need to focus on, which is there is a, a, a far-right international... Uh, mm. in, in, you know, you could go from the Hungarian regime to, uh, you know, the US to Canadian far-right activists to... to, to I mean, think to about bring. the, like, forces mobilising behind Salvini as well. That, you know. Oh, in Italy, of course. I mean, where do Steve we... Steve Bannon says this quite explicitly, that he is uh, part of yeah. a I mean, worldwide uh, ultra-nationalist movement. Which he writes in The Spectator. Well, he calls it economic nationalism. Mm -hmm. The Spectator magazine, a, a, a magazine which uh, had recently an article headlined In Defence of the Wehrmacht, uh, which, uh, which, uh, has, uh, which, which pu publishes uh, d defences of Greek neo-Nazis, uh, which, which had an, uh, a, a, an article saying that black people have uh, lower IQs than white people. Uh, that I mean, we could go on. I mean, it, you Do you know, want to know something really funny about The Spectator? On. I'd, I'd uh, love to hear something vaguely Somebody funny about it. told me, who shall remain nameless, that Fraser Nelson considers the spectator to the be editor. completely devoid of political leaning. That mm, <laughs> weird. Are we talking about the same spectator, bruv? That's weird. what Piers Morgan says about himself as well, isn't it? But uh, people chat all kinds of shit. It's don't the but there's a thing: of a the, the mainstream media, middle-aged white man of that age. But the mainstream media is legitimising mm. and mainstreaming uh, the far right. And, and that was our other fear with the Trump demo. You'd have like, you know, it's like with climate change. There's a scientific consensus on climate mm -hmm. change. Climate change is happening as everyone other than cranks think is the case in the same way that this is not flat earth. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's like we'll have someone who support who thinks climate change is an issue. And then on the other side of the argument for balance, we'll have... And you don't want to end up with a situation with Trump where 77% of the population mm -hmm. of Britain have a negative view of him. And then you kind of treat it as a balanced debate mm -hmm. of, you know, as though this is a controversial issue where both sides are equally valid. Valid. Um, but that's that's why it's so important that this mobilisation happened uh, because we managed to overwhelm. Well, we they had to give us a platform on the media, and for example, we had a range of people like Shaisa Aziz, one of the leading uh, Stop Trump activists, um, Assad Rayman, uh, Director of War and One, Pe just centering people at the sharp end of uh, Trumpism who could join the dots with what's happening here. But I do think this is something we've not talked about enough generally on the left. I know 
there is work going on about this, which is there are very, very rich um, American uh, corporate interests and private interests who are going to plough money into this country mm. uh, to try and turn the likes of Tommy Robinson uh, or whatever his real name is um, into... Stephen Yaxley Lennon. That's the one. Into the biggest fascist movement this country has had yeah. since Oswald Mosley in the 30s. And they're gonna, they are already, like, you know, you can see this already. Uh, you know, he's become this iconic figure of the American far right. But they're going to shore him up. They've got the backing of the American government, as we know. And it, and it is it is horrifying, and we need to be able to be in a position to fight back where we have American corporate and private interests um, subsidising and funding um, uh, extreme right movements and right, individuals that's, that's and the where media I take this, this conversation because I don't like it when we all agree. So I think we're all going to agree that uh, Trumpism and the right wing financiers that, that are associated with Trump. I would just call that right wing ethno nationalism, which, right is, a, which, yeah, is, no. a, which is the point where. You, like you and I have differed before and it's more of a uh, have we? yeah we have differed I mean Steve Bannon is obviously a right wing ethno-nationalist On, in terms of like like, uh, do we use the word Trumpism or not um, oh I see yeah I just call it it's a good catch all yeah, yeah no, no 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 and, and I think that it is um, yeah f- like for me it's not a question of like and this makes you one of the impure because it's not that kind of thing it's about um, you know what are you gesturing towards and I think the problem with calling it Trumpism in the British context is that it is it um, says that these politics are an invasion of Britain, whereas actually mm. I think that they've emanated from the centre of power, of course, yeah. and they are completely. What do you mean by that? They've emanated from the centre of power. They've emanated from the centre of power in terms of scaremongering um, by immigrants has been a technique, um, or the technique of the new Labour government. You think about figures like uh, Neil Hamilton, who I think you've got a video. Yeah, we're going to show of. a video of Neil Hamilton. Um, in a second. But you know, he was part. He was part of the kind of um, you know dregs of Monday Club. Um, you know, he's kind of, you know, high Tory, uh, wanted to, you know, privatise schools and, you know, your bone marrow and all the rest of it, who, you know, having been discredited for being, you know, arch sleazebag for, you know, cash for qu- questions and losing his seat in 97, has had to reinvent himself yeah. as, a, you know, deus vault hashtagging a white ethno-nationalist who you can see him struggling to name the Twitter handles of all these other like you know um, let's go straight let's go types. straight to UKIP because we've got a video now we've yeah, got, go we've got a video saved up so UKIP um, are looking at this point I mean it's explicit that they are trying to be the home of the UK alt-right it's clear mm-hmm. that there are interests in America that are trying to fund and facilitate the generation of an alt-right movement in Britain similar to that that existed in the United States um, UKIP have decided that that's what they want to uh, include, sort of like within their party, that's the energy they want to absorb. Uh, They used to have a policy of distancing themselves from the EDL and from the street movements that existed around Mm -hmm. Tommy Robinson. Uh, That has gone into an absolute reverse. They're doing the complete opposite at this point. So their new leader, Gerard Batten, was at the Free Tommy demo on Saturday, uh, calling the Prophet Muhammad a paedophile. Um, he has also, yeah, that's true. I didn't know that's that. That's true. Really didn't know that. Uh, he's that's also shocking. tweeted a picture of himself shaking hands with Tommy Robinson. Yeah, it's all right. And recently, Milo Yiannopoulos, Paul Joseph Watson, Count Dacula, and Sargon of Akkad, these guys have some fucking ridiculous names, uh, <laughs> have been welcomed with open arms into UKIP. And basically, for comedy purposes, we are going to look at the welcome video uh, that Neil Hamilton oh God, made. I can't watch it again. I can't watch these it. Can't watch it again. Guys. Today I'm celebrating the news that the EU withdrawal bill has received royal assent. Now this means we've finally embarked on the first step to achieving the Brexit that 17.4 million Britons voted for on June 23rd, 2016. It's taken over two years just to get to this point, thanks to the constant meddling of the political establishment and Theresa May's shambolic shilly-shallying. It's now up to UKIP to unite and make the final push for an independent Britain something I've campaigned for since I joined the Anti-Common Market League way back in 1967. UKIP is at last going forward again under Gerard Batten, and I'm excited to learn that a number of big-name social influencers have joined the party. I'd like to welcome Paul Joseph Watson, Sargon of Akkad, Count Dankula, and Milo Yiannopoulos to our party. Now, if you're not a social media animal, some of these names may seem a bit strange, but they're all true crusaders for freedom of expression, and I'm delighted they realise that UKIP 
is the only party committed to this principle. I look forward to them developing truly dank memes that will trigger lefty lovies like Gary Lineker, James O'Brien and the rest of their politically correct establishment chums. The future is looking bright for UKIP under Gerard Batten and a strong UKIP means a strong Brexit. Onwards, upwards and out. I think that's probably a nod to Paul Joseph Watson with that map in the background of Wales. Obviously, Neil Hamilton is a member of the Welsh Assembly uh, representing UKIP. Obviously. Uh, Ash has introduced quite a lot about him today. I was looking him up today. The first thing he did of significance in Parliament was oppose the ban on leaded petrol, uh, which is quite a start to a career. But the serious issue is UKIP have a clear strategy here, which is to absorb the alt-right and try and build out of that a political movement based on the idea that the Tories have betrayed the Brexit movement mm -hmm. and sort of using the same tropes that were quite successful for the American alt-right as saying that sort of, one, white people are under threat from Muslims and two... Sorry, lads. Two, yeah, two, this is being... There's a conspiracy between liberal elites and immigrants and we're not allowed to say anything anymore. Obviously, lots of these demos are organised around the framing of free speech um, because Tommy Robinson has been imprisoned for uh, reporting outside a court case, even though that was illegal because he was going to undermine the court case. But what I'm saying, to cut to the chase, to get to the question, can this work? Do you think UKIP can be a significant electoral force in Britain or a effective social force I mean, uh, I... in British politics? What, watching that video... Um... I I genuinely question the wisdom of us laughing at it because I think that the alt-right have had a very sophisticated social media strategy which is predicated on its own unsophistication, right? The fact that it's unrefined, it's often clunky. It's either so ridiculous and meme-based that it looks insular and you just think, well, you have to dismiss it because it's marginal. Or on the other hand, you know, like Trump is not good at Twitter, most of his shares are like hate shares. And that was the same when he was campaigning. He's an absolutely atrocious performer. You know, he, he would do weird shit like that and yet became president. So I think that, you know, the alt-right central to their strategy is that no one will take them seriously until it's too late and they're already at the center of power with their hands on the levers. And then I think that then, you know, leads us to our second question, which is, well, what do we do about it? Um, you know, I laugh at things that I find intensely frightening all the time, but that's a catharsis, that's a release, and that serves no one but me and to maybe solidify some connections with like my friends, my comrades, and my family. Um, it's not it's not a political response, and it's certainly, it's certainly not resistance. Um, and so then we have to think about another strategy, because the other one that we have has also been anticipated by which we name uh, their politics as being... Uh, as being racist, right? As being um, uh, fascistic and scary. And they also wear that as a badge of honor because they've managed to play this game around censorship, around um, an appeal to white aggrievement and, uh, you know, white self victimhood in which any time you observe that something is racist is more racist than racism. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's because we let the ground beneath our feet slip away from us and we let ourselves be drawn onto thinking of uh, race, identity, belonging as primarily cultural phenomena which we deal with by trying to change uh, people's sentiments and we try and deal with those viewpoints that we find um, frightening, distasteful, uh, reactionary through the you know lexicon of, of morality and I think those things have been completely inadequate what I think we need to do and I think that this is something that we need to do in this country do I think that UKIP will be a significant electoral force again well maybe enough to uh, commit the conservatives to a hard Brexit or exacerbate their implosion maybe enough to mitigate against uh, those voices in the Labour Party which would advocate a more progressive migration strategy and certainly enough to make it really frightening to be a person of colour in this country to be a Muslim person in this country when Tommy Robinson gets out of prison which will be 
later this year at some point because he's probably not going to serve the entirety of his sentence that's going to be a really fucking scary mm-hmm. time yeah, for us absolutely and, and people l- aren't prepared for that they're, they're just not prepared for that and laughing at poorly shot videos does nothing to reassure me that for Muslim kids on their way to school, for you know women wearing hijab, for anyone who's got the misfortune of being mistaken as being Muslim, that we've got an answer to that as the left to resist these movements. All right, so let's talk about that answer. So it looks quite clear that when Tommy Robinson gets out of prison, he's going to be treated kind of like a Nelson Mandela type figure. There's obviously a lot of political and probably financial capital being expended on raising consciousness about his supposed plight even though he's in prison for a normal amount of time for doing what's explicitly a crime to which he has pleaded guilty to it's not particularly controversial but anyway it's clear that those forces are amassing around him Owen how do we resist how do we try to undermine that swelling of support that seems to be potentially uh, coalescing around Tommy Robinson we saw 15,000 people on the street in the beginning of June. Bigger demo than the one that was on the weekend, potentially because England were playing that day. So there clearly is purchase for Tommy Robinson's politics. He gets a million views on YouTube quite often. We don't know how many of those are in America. but A lot of them are American, by the way. And Paul Joseph Watson, again, a lot of those are American. But it seems like this is a politics that has some purchase. Um, I think there are two big strands of thought in the British left Mm. about how to deal with this. One of them is to create a big sort of left block the kind of people that would be on the stock trump demo Mm -hmm. and kind of do a cordon sanitaire around anyone that would have turned up to that fifteen thousand person demo at the beginning of june the other one is to try and win over the people who might be attracted to the politics of tommy robinson with potentially a socialist alternative or with any other kind of political message that thinks they can pull those people away from Mm. that particular far right politics what do you think yeah i mean i would say look tommy robinson is a overwhelmingly you know public opinion is overwhelmingly hostile to him i i, I mean i'm not being complacent here that you know I, I get look, so i'll stop with the caveats His public opinion was overwhelmingly hostile to trump as well right in the u.s not though. no not in the same way no tommy robinson in this country has seen over you know the edl which was a part of 88 mm. percent or something had a negative view of it and 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 you know his later incarnate you know which is why even Nigel Farage would sin it, you know, Nigel Farage would try and put, put distance between him and, and Toby Robinson for, for, for very clear political reasons, even though a lot of his key associates like Raheem Kassam have been very pro or, you know, apologists for Tommy Robinson. No, I think, I think for me, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I what, what I, what I, what I worry, I mean, is the, what sorry i'm just spitting out words here what i worry about is if i think back to when ukip were a marginal political force Mm -hmm. and when they started to tick up votes there were lots to be brutally honest around ed miliband's leadership who were quite triumphalist about that Mm -hmm. because they thought this divides the right and it will open up you know it will it, it will help us gain power which is what the polls look like at the moment, right? Because Labour have what, overtaken the Tories and that's, th- that's my worry. many Conservative voters have gone to UKIP. That is my worry. That is my worry. Because actually, in the end, you know, there was this view that UKIP was just going to... And actually, it, it, it actually, the cookie crumbled in different ways in different constituencies. Mm. But what it definitely did was um, inject and legitimise, because the Conservative Party then responded uh, by... And, and, and actually, Labour Party, they ended up in a du- Dutch art auction mm. in that um, particularly 20... 12 to 12 2015 period basically their response was we need to talk more and more about immigration mm. the more they did it in a negative way obviously the more you kept kept rising in the polls you know it was the, it, it's not only just politically wrong it was it was counterproductive if they thought that was a way of containing of a cordon sanitaire around yeah. ukip mm. because it actually ended up with ukip getting what 12 percent um, of the vote when actually their polling was much lower than that you know when when that strategy began so i think my my, my worry at the moment is ukip are you know we've only had a few polls but the, the, there is enough evidence to suggest that they're you know the the stab in the back portrayal of the uh traditional populist right trope or far right trope um of of national betrayal is kicking in over UK, uh, over over Brexit, and UKIP are are benefiting from that. Um, and I worry that you know, obviously, these social media influencers or whatever, um, as um, 
as the uh, disgraced former Conservative politician Neil Hamilton uh, refers to them. Um, you know, th- th- I don't know how much purchase they have in Britain because they are disproportionately kind of, they have an American audience. Um, but there, there is there is a potential opening for them. And we saw what UKIP did very successfully was to basically shift the Conservative Party v- dramatically closer to their politics and the hard right of the Conservative Party is now stronger than it's been um, for a very long time the like of J.K. Rees-Mogg and, and others and the people who back J.K. Rees-Mogg are, are frightening so I, I, I just think that's why we shouldn't be complacent when people look at the polling you know and we have a very polarised electorate or maybe the signs are shifting but the rise of UKIP which a lot of people did feel quite triumphalist about in when that happened in 2013 has transformed this country in ways which are very disturbing and horrifying and have you know injected a poison which mm-hmm. we are we will suffer the consequences of for a very long time to come so I, I i just think and now the conservative party will go in a panic where they will try and adapt their politics and and uh, to to what i think to the rise of you what's what controversial is that it's fucking stupid for people on the center left to try and fan the far right because they think it will be electorally advantageous yeah. no, but, it's but, exactly but, what hillary clinton did but, they actively exactly, promoted yeah. donald trump to be the candidate yeah, they they like, well, it would be great, easier yeah. to beat him yeah, yeah. and then they ended up enabling the far right to gain a presidency in the united states ash question for you oh no but i had a little thing and then the question Okay, real quick, go on. Real quick. I, that's why I think that, like, um, where, you know, you have figures like Peter Manson and Tony Blair fanning the flames of this Brexit betrayal narrative, I think is very, very dangerous indeed. Because it's not something which then adds up to people desiring either greater proximity to the institutional arrangements of the EU or wanting to remain in the EU. All it does is whip up this thing of like, see, even they're fucking saying it. Like, you know, we're being screwed over by everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think it really um, impedes the progress of any politics of hope that could be represented by Jeremy Corbyn or a similarly socialist project elsewhere. Um, I think it's really irresponsible. But yeah, I'll take the question. Final question. It's going to be for both of you. We've been here a while. I'm sweating like a pig. I'm an Aries, Leo, rising, Scorpio, moon. Was that the question? I think, can't you only have one star sign? No, because you have your your (laughs) star sign, you have your ascending and you have your moon sign. Okay, serious question. Serious question. Of the 15,000 people that went on the free Tommy Robinson demo on the 9th of June, Mm -hmm. of the 5,000 people that were at that demo on Saturday, how many of those are we hoping to, are we aiming to win over to the politics of the left? Mm -hmm. Or should we completely give up and just try and isolate every single person that was on that march it's a controversial question who wants to go first i'll take it ash um okay i think that most of those people will not come back to the left or they were never really part of it but i think there are lots of people there who maybe went because their mates went and felt a bit uncomfortable you know young people like do this kind of shit and you read accounts of people who used to be part of far right street movements and often they're people who were emotionally really lost um not necessarily uh, drawn from the pits of socioeconomic abjection, as some commentators would like to have you believe, but are kind of looking for something to feel a sense of joy and meaning and collective expression in. And those are things which the left can provide. You know, I am not averse to um, becoming friends with uh, becoming comrades with standing shoulder to shoulder with someone who was maybe once part of that march I just don't think that's the majority of the people on that march I think that the left always has room for transformation for learning and for change because otherwise the left wouldn't exist the left is all about learning more and adapting your politics to uh, meet that circumstance what I do think that we have and this is something which we haven't focused on so much because we've almost I think bought into the idea that to uh, that a leftist economic program is always attractive but a leftist social vision is unattractive because it's all about you know oppression olympics or you know who's ideologically pure and all the rest of it i don't think that that's a uh, leftist tendency i think that that's us having interpreted the kind of worst aspects of social relations under capitalism and reproducing that where i saw a leftist politic and what i enjoyed most about friday actually because like the mass rally great march great um was when me and owen and michael and some others ended up an impromptu rave in the middle of soho which i think what must have been like 
at least 2,000 people maybe it was yeah, like yeah, fucking yeah. loads uh, a lorry like it was Notting Hill Carnival pumping out 1970s disco and everyone going absolutely wild and at first it was just protesters and then it was protesters who'd been walking that way and then it was just people and it was really romantic right there was a romance to it like collective joy spontaneity expression and it's really hard to feel alienated or disgruntled by it apart from that one guy who called me a packy and i'm still looking for his address um him. yeah fuck him um but that was really beautiful he wasn't part of it just he so wasn't part of it. he wasn't he was just some rando who was really annoyed about having to go down a crowded street because the sight of people having fun just really upset him wanker um but like at you know that for me is a vision of a leftist politics and that i think you know is how we win is just being happier more joyous less afraid and less apologetic than them i think we have to be unapologetic and also strategic Oh, yeah. Well, we're not going to tell our politics to uh, try and win over a ragtag bunch of 2,000 people who, who turned up to a, 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 a rally in support of a bigoted charlatan fraudster. Um, and I mean, one of the people, you know, he was he was he was videoed um, haranguing, well, not haranguing, um, of, of aggressively abusing a journalist for Al Jazeera and saying, "Oh, the Muslims are behind you," uh, and they called him a slag. It turns out he's the owner of a restaurant in 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 in, in East London. Oh, Hornchurch. We don't Hornchurch. claim that. That's Sorry, that's Essex. Essex right? <laughs> not to declare war on Essex or anything. No, 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 Essex. Essex is fine. We have many great friends from Essex, friends that's of the show. Thing. Uh, yep, he is. He's you know on the good ones, but the bank is in Hornchurch. Just I wouldn't want to rob that from Essex. But you, you know? did get that. You know, we got that. I remember during the kind of you know when there was the whole thing about football hooliganism in the nineties, late nineties, more, and a lot of those mm. people ended up being like they were pub landlords. They weren't mm. people. They were kind of lower middle class, I suppose, traditionally, or property owners or business owners. I, I don't think these were pe- this sense of there are people the far right always prey on um, who we do need to win over who are you know those when the politics of scapegoating muslims and migrants and refugees and and that well that's mainstream politics forget about the far right that's mainstream politics that's been mainstream politics in the western world uh for a very long time accelerated after the financial crash obviously we need to win over people from that but those are not people who would ever dream of going on a pro tommy robinson march which is why a derisory number went that's not to be complacent the far right is stronger stronger now than it's been since the 1930s in this country uh it's getting stronger it has the financial material political moral support of the ascendant us far right um but we're not going to tailor our politics to those people and that would be bizarre and just self-defeating um you know it's very clear that you know our biggest struggle is amongst older people um in terms of labor's electoral position who tend to on immigration and multiculturalism um not have the same position as people in the studio um but you know I don't think for a second this idea of, you know, these are marches by the young disenfranchised who are representative of the um, devastated post-industrial communities of the North East or the North West or the Midlands is a nonsense. It's insulting to those people. It's insulting. The idea of people I grew up with, the idea they'd go on a Tommy Robinson march, I mean, they'd be disgusted. They would not often have on immigration multiculturalism and refugees and migrants and muslims the sort of opinions uh, and views that i would want them to have and they I, I think you know that we need to win them over to our politics of hope but we're not going to win over people who are part of you know there will be exceptions that will happen without us tailoring our politics mm. to somehow reaching out to those people on that particular demonstration who are disproportionately you know fanatically they are the most fanatically minded people uh, in the country on those issues if you're going to sacrifice a big portion of your uh, of, of your Saturday um, and, and there's not that many of you then you are by definition the vanguard mm. of that particular movement and they are not people we, we should ever seek to tailor our politics to winning over even if we will win some of them over without having 
try to do it. No, my the view is that we have a politics which bla- which directs responsibility to the bankers, the tax dodgers, the multinational corporations that offers a genuine, inspiring alternative, asking those at the top to pay more money to invest in public services, utilities under public ownership, a genuine living wage, uh, the abolition of tuition fees, and so on. And that's the basic minimum. And that will win people over and, and shift the conversation away from migrants and refugees and Muslims. That's what Labour did in the general election. And we did win over people who voted Conservative in UKIP in 2015 on that principle basis. And that's what we have to keep doing. We have to double down on that, a, a populist message of blame those at the top of society for the injustices you face. Um, and, and that will win over people uh, who otherwise that politics, you know, we've seen across the continent of of, of the, the other centre left uh, or the social democratic parties who have the technocratic third way politics of the past. Um, and, and they left a vacuum which the populist and xenophobic right are filling. They're in political meltdown. The Labour Party is one of the only parties in the entire continent of Europe which does not face political extermination at the moment. And that's because of the politics that Labour's offering. So we double down on that. We go out into our communities. We need to do far more to go into, particularly, you know, I've been the Momentum on Seat campaign, knocking doors in Mansfield. We lost that seat. It's median age is much old. You know, it's it's basically working class white men in their 40s and 50s. We need to win over. But we're not going to do that by conceding the argument on, on refugees, on immigrants and Muslims. I don't think anybody here thinks we should. We're going to do it by offering that genuine, inspiring alternative. And, and, and that's what we do. And if we win... People, and wearing V-necks. Yeah. I, Have you got V-necks. something against... What's your problem with V-necks? <laughs> I'm just Round joking. Next. I was joking. I was making it. I feel really insecure <laughs> now. A joke. <laughs> All right, it's got to that time of the evening where I can't understand what's a joke and what's not a joke. Uh, I feel like my t-shirt is now so sweaty when I try and wipe my forehead, it just makes my forehead more wet. I've got like the shiny nose of like a dog. Like I always get that, like the sweat is just... It's Why is having a white t-shirt? Thing. You're going to see yeah, through. Yeah, I don't wear white for a reason. That's why I always wear it's a black t-shirt. I don't because I always spill things uh, on myself. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think it's been uh, very productive. Thank you for coming along, Owen. I learned. Always a pleasure. Yeah. No Ash, sure. obviously always a delight. Yeah. I don't need to thank you for coming, though, because it's don't, also your Don't tell your lies. Home it's too. unbecoming. Uh, if you enjoyed this show, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Obviously, tell all your friends to do the same. And very importantly, please go to support.navaramedia.com. Rent don't come for free. Uh, and it would really help us build this project so we can keep getting better and better, build our reach, uh, build our regularity. Um, so that's support.navaramedia.com. Thank you, Ash Sarkar. Thank Woo. you, Owen Ow. Jones. This was Tiski Sour. We'll see you next Monday. Guten bye bye. <laughs>